you know, all my life I've, I've heard and been taught, hey, go through kindergarten, go through 12th grade, get your bachelor's degree, get your master's degree, get your PhD, and then go out to the work world and work for 40 years, get the gold watch, and you'll enjoy your into retirement. There's, there's the American dream, right? <laughs> yeah, that's not working. That's not my plan. I, I intended that, but... Yeah, yeah. This is kind, of, kind of not working that way at this particular point. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody that's logging on. Um, I'm excited to have you, Darius. What a great conversation you and I have had previously. I'd love for you to kind of introduce yourself and talk about what you're doing, where you're at, um, and then we'll just take it from there. Yeah, well, it, it, it's it's not a really exciting story, but it, it is true. Um, I'm a native of San Francisco. Um, I fell into the wireless technology space about 35 years ago. I helped a guy named Craig McCall build the first initial wireless infrastructure here uh, in California, uh, which was 1G compared to 5G, which is where we are now, ironically enough. Um, I fell in love with uh, Angel Seed Venture Capital Private Equity as a result of being in the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, uh, five years ago, I was brave enough or silly enough uh, to dive into the cannabis space, uh, head first, feet first, however you want to call it. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, helped maybe four or five um, associates build cannabis funds from the ground up. But five years ago, walking into a VC's office or an investor's office and saying, hey, I'm here to talk about cannabis and I'm here to talk about investment capital was not the conversation. Not the right. conversation. Right. So we have a mutual friend uh, that hooked us up and uh, said it might be logical for me to come talk to you. It's all good. Well, I love it. So tell me a little bit what your journey looked like in this. I know earlier going from the telecom or the, the dot com space to now the cannabis space. I right. Agree. What does that look like for you? Well, it was really strange because, you know, I walked into a neighborhood where I grew up uh, as a kid in a, a horrible area called East Oakland. And ironically enough, I looked across the freeway uh, and the place where Al Davis built the Coliseum. Uh, where he is now, but left Oakland three times and is in Las Vegas, but it's not in Las Vegas because you can't play the stadium where you can't play. It's all wrong. Anyway, um, walked into a 75,000 square foot indoor grow and I went, oh my God, is this what they did with the Nabisco factory where my mom used to work? This is unreal, right? Yeah. And those guys have gone on to become one of the largest players in all of California. I won't mention their name. Um, and I said, wait a minute this is an industry now. I mean, people are doing this now. And so um, that's where I figured, you know, I'd start playing around with building investment funds from the ground up. And again, it has not been easy um, because we all know anybody who's been in this industry or the hemp industry knows it's about having access to capital and then figuring out that the compliance part is really tough. Finding this right seed is really tough. Planting it is really tough. Getting it to grow to a certain st stage is really tough, but that's only one tenth of the battle. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So what would you say the biggest battles have been for people? You know, I, I hate to say it because we're still in this kind of confused scenario. Is, is it good for the feds? Is it good for the state? Is it good for the counties? Is it good for the city? Is it good for the soil? Is it good for the ozone? I mean, we're all asking these questions and there's all yeah. these, these political battles between going on between all these people um, and one of the notes I wrote you was, oh, Jesus Christ, um, biomass on Kush.com for hemp is $5 a pound. And then in Illinois, it's $3,500 a pound for THC, where they did a billion dollars in 2020 in, in, in sales. Their first year, right? So it's, it's, it's a huge question mark about where you are, where you want to be. If you believe in this industry, if you believe in the science, and you think that it's going to work on a federal level here, on a state level here, on a county level here. Um, but around the world, this science is doing well. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Yeah. So two questions before we jump into what you've seen outside of the U.S. compared to now. Because since you and I have spoken, I've used actually your term a number of times in 
Um, it's funny to me how the United States is still trying to figure out where to plant seeds or how to plant seeds and other countries are, I mean, they're way beyond that, right? But with that being said, first, what about, why do you feel like the cannabis industry should be treated like the mistakes in the dot-com era? Um, you know, where do you compare them. I mean, cause it, once I read this this morning, it, I immediately was like, oh, you're, you're exactly right. I, and a lot of the same players were having the same conversations. Right, right. I, 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 lo I love to do things by, you know, learning from mistakes. I mean, come on. When we were kids, if mom said the oven was hot, what do we do? Right. We touch the oven, right? <laughs> and, and what did we discover? Ouch, it hurts, right? Yeah. And so <laughs> through from my dot-com days, I learned that it's like the gold rush. And I live in the gold rush area in California. It's like the gold rush. When things are good, Everybody flocks to a situation or an area and they think they're really excited. They want to get involved, but they really don't have a clue what it is. And they haven't done the homework to know what the exit strategy is going to be. I mean, where's the ROI? Where's the exit strategy? Right. Yeah. We're all excited. Great opportunity. But uh, the dot com thing taught me one thing. Um, first of all, it was an intangible. It was software. It wasn't anything you could touch. Right. Um, and then secondly, uh, everybody was pouring their money into it, but then when they figured out that the labor could be done at one eighth the cost offshore, what happened? All the labor lot left and it went to India, for God's sake, right? Um, so, uh, same thing here. Um, somebody realized that it was a really profitable industry, went real slow, you know, five years ago, but I've no known people in the mountains and Humboldt that have been doing this for 35 to 40 years on the black market. So, is it really a big deal? Uh, don't know. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of people that have been in it, even in the construction space, so the textile space, that have been playing with these fibers and researching them in other countries for a long time. You know, right. this is something I really have a hard time with is a lot of our talent and knowledge is considered black market, right? And cross, right. The crossing those over from one, one line of business to the next or bringing you to it, it's a different type of business, right? You went from not dare sharing anything or saving text messages, you know, because you were afraid you were going to be raided to now it's out in the open and you're watching people really grow where those that have been in it that really hold the state, the trade secrets are not as much. Right. What does that look like? How do we balance that? And well, you know, all my life I've, I've, heard and been taught, hey, go through kindergarten, go through 12th grade, get your bachelor's degree, get your master's degree, get your PhD, and then go out to the work world and work for 40 years, get the gold watch, and you'll enjoy your into retirement. There's there's the American dream, right? <laughs> yeah, that's not working. That's not my plan. I, I intended that, but... Yeah, yeah. Just not kind, of, kind of not working that way at this particular point. So now we've got the gig economy and most of the extractors that I met, they did not, they do not have a bachelor's of science. Most of the great extractors that I met that are leaving the cannabis industry, going into the hemp industry, attempting to move from 1,000 square foot extraction facilities to 500,000 square foot facilities did not go to college. They just really honed their experience from the ground up, literally, right? And so now, as it said in my email, in 2019, we had a quarter million of acres of hemp. That's a lot of biomass. It's a lot of biomass. What are you going to do with all that weight? That's a lot of stuff, right? So we discovered after throwing away a whole lot of that flower stem, right, uh, we're going to have to get creative on what to do with it. And so um, I'm not going to say I don't believe in Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Wall right. Street. I'm not right. going to say that. Uh, we need we need those entities. Those things are very important to our economy. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of people in this industry that come from the black market side that know more about this science than anybody anywhere that I've ever met. So um, we need to keep our 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 minds open. Bingo. Right. Yeah. I think you nailed it because I think it is. It's when we. I mean, I even ran into this, and I I really haven't. I don't, I'm not hands on with this, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the, I'm mm -hmm. the association piece and the connection and the media piece. Right. Um, and I love putting a microphone in front of people and saying, here, you tell me your story. I love learning about it. Right. right. But as soon as I said to somebody, 
I don't have a bank account, my credibility went. Right, no right, reason. right. There's, I mean, people have to understand that are not in the industry that simple things like that or marketing or insurance that right. exists in every other industry and in every other vertical does not happen here in the cannabis space. That's and right, right. That's right. Yeah. So, so, so if you, if you think you want to get into the business, you say, okay, okay, we're going to, we're going to follow the normal format of what it takes to start a business. We're going to build a team. We're going to build a biz plan. We're going to do financials, ROI, exit strategy, marketing, sales, brand and image. Oh, we're going to open a bank account because we need that in order to build a line of credit. No, it, right. it's, it's just not the, the normal way. So you have to be really, really, really creative. You've, you've got to find the, I did, and I'm still working on it. Those signs, those 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 forms of lines of credit, uh, those form those forms of compliance that understand it from the ground up. Um, the banking people, the the venture capital people, the all the professionals that really make it easier for you to do what you should focus be focus on is growing your business, is scaling right. your business, right? Right. Well, okay, so speaking of scaling and growing, when we take our United States compared to any other country, what are you seeing in comparison? You know, where where are we at reality wise compared to the rest of the globe? And I run into this Darius from state to state. Right. You know, even a small grow in a state may think they're a big grow and nationally they're a, a little grow. Yeah. Right? They don't know. They or they haven't researched it or looked or there haven't been platforms or places to go and find that information right and and so the, the, there's two sides to that oh the three sides of that i think okay a friend of mine owns 200 acres here in your county but he's only allowed to grow on two acres right of thc um but with that two acres he supplies four dispensaries doing seven million ebitda per right that's pretty doggone good right yeah. um and, and then on the other side of that scale i've got a hundred thousand square foot building in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but they're growing inside pods, inside shipping pods. And they did $15 million last year growing inside these pods, right? So there's, there's this conversation of indoor and outdoor grow, grow. And there's also a conversation of where to move the product when, when it's ready. Um, and so, but that takes me to my first raise in uh, the Netherlands uh, was 400,000 square foot of automated grow. And now I'm hearing about, in Europe, they've got artificial intelligence running vertical grows. Really? 500,000 square feet. Really? What are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? Um, Canada, uh, where the market is, Aurora just shut down 500,000 square feet of indoor grow. So it really depends on what you plan to do with the plant when it's time to harvest. Really? Um, are you a niche grower? Are you partnering with Nike making tennis shoes? Um, are you are you selling isolated distillate to Bay Area, you know, Bay Area uh, uh, group science? Um, is this is this pharmaceutical? Is it biotech? Is it material? Is it hempcrete? What do you want to do with the flower or the stem? Uh, that's there's in my opinion there shouldn't be a molecule of that plant left after harvest. You should find some place for every molecule of that plant. Quite honestly. So, well, and I'm hoping it'll get there. How yeah. far are we? I mean, because like you said, in other countries, AI is a real thing. And AI right. is, I mean, as much as we talk about how many jobs we can bring, because as we try to approach this from a different angle of economic development and research and rural community and so forth, right? Because really, that's where my heart went back even to supply chain and labor laws as soon as hemp came. Yes. To I mean, hemp is a solution for so much of this. You know, and then there's this reservation. Well, we don't want AI because it doesn't bring jobs into the market. Right. However, the jobs that are created from the product after processing far outweigh the number of jobs we can create in one facility and the amount of uh, product or our time to process on a 24 seven scale, right? With scalability with AI mm -hmm. opens doors for us that we can, I feel like now allows potentially would allow the U S to compete with other markets. If we can hurry up and get bigger, better facilities. Well, th there are people in my life that were born before the television was invented. Right. Um, I have people in my life that are still afraid to go to the ATM because they don't want to put their money in it or take it out of it. So 
Um, and I'm one of those people who carried, you know, a five pound walkie talkie and said, you talk through this thing, it works. I swear it's going to work. And so uh, society and technology are going to keep moving forward, right? We, we are going to have autonomous pizza delivery here very soon. We are, we're going to get packages delivered by Amazon by drone mm -hmm. right now, right? Um, but guess who has to fix those machines inside the Amazon warehouse? Right, right. They're, they're human beings, right? right? And so, yes, you know, I know we come from a USDA thought process farming community here in America. I get it. Um, but if we're going to compete with the growers down in Colombia who are shipping by the ton around the world, we, we've got to we've got to pick up the pace. We've got we've got to move forward on on several levels, uh, and that's why I said at the end of the email, I said, look, even if we had quarter million, half a million pounds grown here again in America this year, we had access to all the capital we needed to to move the industry forward. What would we do differently? Uh, that's a good question. Well, what do you think? What would that look like? Or or what do you suggest the change needs to be? Well, you know. Just like the technology industry where Asia and Europe were kicking our butt and they still are kicking our butt on the technology side, there's no reason why California is the third largest economic or fifth largest economic power in the world. We go through three, $3 trillion GDP. We don't have a fast train. We don't have a speed train. Why not? Leaving Sacramento, going to L.A. and getting there in half an hour. Come on. It just We've had fast trains in Europe for years. We've had 4 and 5G in Asia and Europe for years. Why are we the last on the totem pole uh, to move forward with ag tech? Does it make any sense? Um, our, our government and our innovators need to move forward and, and uh, you know, stop letting the banks process all the money and get some of the money to the people who need it. That's my opinion. Okay, so what do you think the government needs or the USDA needs in support to bridge that gap back, back to our farmers or our consumers? You know, we talk a lot about, well, what do we do for the government or what are we going to change to accommodate them? What is it you think that they need on their side to really grow this and be sustainable? Well, I, again, as a native of San Francisco and knowing all the people from the Willie Browns to the Gavin Newsom's to the Diane Feinstein's to the Barbara Boxers, right. that all came from San Francisco and now in federal government. And some of them are even invested in the cannabis space. Um, I hate to say it because I don't like to talk about politics, religion. We got to get involved. We've got to get involved. We've got to get our hands and feet dirty and get up there to the state level uh, with the people that make those decisions. Sure. Uh, the, the state of Gal the state of Virginia is trying to figure it out right now. For the first time in their lives, their governor is going, "Okay, yes, let's grow." Right? But he has no clue about what's been happening in the other states that were successful or that were failures. Right. Uh, the folks that have been doing it need to talk to the people that are trying to do it and let them know these are the pros and the cons. And this is what you should do. Period. Uh, so that's exactly what I want to be. Right. I want to be that. Let's put a microphone in front of them and find out what works and be that go to platform where, um, you know, we can come back and say, hey, this worked for us and this didn't work. And here's where we're struggling. And here's a group of people that can get together and solve problems and have real discussions. Right. Uh, yeah. That's right. what I'm sure. I'm, yeah. I'm excited about it. Uh, so yeah. tell me, do you mind giving a little bit of history or background? Um, I know you mentioned at the bottom of your email, George Washington. And a lot of times when we talk about this, you know, people think, well, this is a brand new product and it's scary. And it's not all the way back to George Washington. Right. 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 What are some of your favorite like aha moments or key points people should listen to? So it was so funny this morning when I put that into Google, it came back and said, uh, Wikipedia said to be in verbal out of, uh, out of Google said, George Washington did not mess with cannabis. He just grew hemp. <laughs> ah, so funny. But yeah, okay. it, it's, it's somewhat of a joke because 5,000 years before George Washington got here, people were using cannabis for medicinal reasons. So uh, right. yeah, and, 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 then, and then it moves to, in our history, it moves to uh, the laws that were made in 1937, you know, the, the Marijuana Act. Uh, and then uh, the illustrious uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon in the 70s did the, uh, uh, the Controlled Substance Act uh, with schedule, making cannabis Schedule One. Uh, and then I find it the, the real irony now is 
The private prisons are traded publicly on, on, on the NASDAQ. You can go buy shares now, but we can also buy shares in public cannabis traded companies as well at the same time. It is the, um, the biggest and funniest and most amusing irony I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and the funny thing is, is the industry going to stop at this point? Do you think so? 2021 is it for cannabis and, and hemp. What do you think? No, we're not stopping. Yeah. Not even kind of. In fact, I think we've the pandemic gave us a leg hold on the market. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. really, I said this for a while, as much work as as people could possibly get done right. while the government was shut down, put the mm -hmm. industry ahead of the government. That's um, right. And maybe I shouldn't say that out loud, but I mean, the more traction we have and the less focus that was given to regulations huh? before the industry had an opportunity to regulate itself and fix some of its own issues. And right. Right. What, are, what about standardization? You know, there's a lot of conversation about need for standardization within the industry and the industry regulating itself versus, um, you know, the government and or ISO or ASTM setting some of those regulations and standards. What's your opinion? Well, you know, again, San Francisco is the the ground bed for biotech, biopharma, stem cell, all that stuff, right? And so when see, people say CGMP, uh, kind of USDA regulated or organic, uh, mm -hmm. I laugh um, because Bayer Crop Science has been here for years with 70 acres growing, uh, doing research. But here's the good news or my good news. And a lot of people are not going to want to hear it, but it's the truth. Uh, the Biden administration coming in, Kamala Harris coming from San Francisco. Uh, and I kind of know, you know, what, how these guys think and what, what their plans are. I've, I've got high hopes for the future. I've, I've got, I feel good about the next four years um, because again, before the five years I decided to get into it, I, I grew up since the sixties in San Francisco. What do you think I've seen? Right. Right. Uh, what do you, what do you think right. I've seen? Well, right? it's, it's been around, right? right? It's not, right. it hasn't been so full pop. being in Utah. It's the totally opposite. Right. 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 We run very different charges when it comes to where we stand as far as states on this. Right. Well, well, listen, Colorado started it all, right? Mm -hmm. Denver, Colorado started it all, right? Uh, as far as telling the feds, hey, you guys, what you're thinking, what you're doing is ridiculous. It just doesn't make any sense anymore. And so, you know, come into the 20th century, come into, come into the light. Uh, and and with all the things happening with our taxes and and the cities and the counties and the states needing additional revenue. What, what's what's more obvious? I mean, it, it's it's not killing anybody. As a matter of fact, it's healing some people for God's sake. So, you know, you know Oklahoma has done a really good job, Darius, at sharing their revenue that's being made from the cannabis and hemp industry and relating it back to very real topics like teacher salaries, right. hospitals, right. you know, beds, homeless care, uh, things that really hit people that are, you know are on the other side of the bridge but i love i love watching that and i love talking about bridging that gap in your email this morning you mentioned that you know there's a number of different verticals or avenues that will be directly affected or impacted by hemp like covid what are some of give me some examples of how those two are related well you know again the, the folks in the industry know what cannabinoids are. They know what terpenes are. They know this, as you, again, it's kind of 5,000 year history. Um, and, you know, my, my dad uh, battled diabetes for 35 or 40 years. Uh, so I got to, I got to witness the um, three open heart surgeries, two amputated legs, failed kidneys, failed liver, glaucoma, blindness, all that stuff from one singular disease. And what people don't seem to realize or grasp at this particular point, uh, I think hemp and cannabis, and you'll see here very shortly, beyond GW, GW Pharmaceuticals, who got the FDA approval for their medication, um, you, you're going to see a lot more research done here, a lot more research. I mean, billions of dollars putting into research here, and you're going to it's going to come out eventually, not right now, but it's going to come out eventually, um, that respiratory diseases, car cardiology, cardiology diseases, uh, neuro neuroscience diseases are going to be battled from the very sciences that come from the cannabinoids and the terpenes that come from this plant, period. Um, well, look, at, look at this, and I know this because I was involved in some transactions related to COVID around yeah. the flower, right? right? 
it, it was being prescribed in other countries with a water bong for inflammation in the respiratory system. Right. Right. And so where they've had the capability, when we talk about where the U.S. is so far behind and they've had the ability to study and research, mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't ignore that. Right. 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 <laughs> right. The stigma we have cannot be denied when there's science involved. Um, now, where we're at in the U.S. and our studies are are much different than other countries, right? And I think that that's where we've again hurt ourselves so badly. Well, well, if if you if you kind of look at it, I, I think maybe in March of 2020, we heard that there was this horrible, deadly virus on the table defined as COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, and in a very short, well, too long for my liking, in a very short period of time, a couple of companies, AstraZeneca, uh, Moderna, uh, and Pfizer. Um, have have got FDA approval to start shipping uh, the vaccine, correct? Mm -hmm. And so if we can resolve because of an international pandemic um, and quarter of a million people dead um, and looking at what happened with the Spanish flu in 18, 19, 20, uh, which was a much worse pandemic than this one, um, we should, uh, just my advice, probably take a closer look uh, at the very science that we're trying to kill uh, that could save lives. That's just my opinion. I, I don't think it's just your opinion. <laughs> There's a lot of people that think like that. And I think that this is a this is where the fight came. You right. know, I, it's been eye opening to me, too, where I really see a huge value to the cannabis plant or to hemp is in the fiber, the mm -hmm. fiber and what we're able to do with it outside of just the health and wellness. Right. But we come back to how our globe or our, we survive, we have to take care of ourselves, right? And that medicine piece is not forgotten. It's talked about all the time in Indian cultures and moving from one country to the other, um, you know, 500, 5,000 years ago and used, right. used in science. Right. What about climate change? How does it affect, you know, we've talked medicine a little bit, COVID. What about climate change and things like well, that? Well, I hate to say it on national any national stream, but I've got people in my family that have worked at the White House level, at the federal level. Okay, good. And, and they're consistently telling me, you know, hey, let's let's plan to get to Mars because this place is a wrap. It's over, right? Uh, let's relocate. Uh, let's let's get to the moon. Let's get to Mars. And I'm trying to tell folks, hey, you guys, our bodies, our souls, everything was designed for the atmosphere that we're in right now, right? Uh, <laughs> We, we kind of need oxygen, kind of need water, else. right? <laughs> we kind of we need the gravity that holds our bodies together. It's kind of important. Um, I say, some people may disagree, but we need to save this place. This, this condo that we live on, we need to save it. Um, and, and, you know, right now the water is being destroyed, which covers 75% of the world, and 75% of our body is water as well. But there's a lot of garbage in the water. Um, and I, I almost think that the pandemic or plandemic is a way for us to stop driving these cars, which is also ruining our, our ecology. Um, and so what I sent you this morning is true. Uh, the cultivation of, of hemp takes a CO2 out of the air, which is something that's killing us as we speak. And so um, there, there are so many advantages scientifically. It is insane. Uh, and we should really stop thinking about the percentage of THC that's in one plant that makes you feel woozy when you inhale it through a smokable flower. That is not the only vertical in the industry, for God's sake. Not um, even close. Not even close, right? So, so stop putting images of a cannabis flower and stop putting images of Cheech and Chong up on every brand because it's not the future of this industry, guarantee you. Where do you think the biggest avenue is? I mean, where do you think, maybe like what is, because I think that proteins and sugars are up there and we're yeah. not starting to talk about those hardly. Um, but I am really, I'm curious, where do you see the biggest gold rush from them? I, I, think, I think you said it earlier. Um, it, it is the industry that's gonna re-stimulate this economy. I mean, we've we've got a few issues right now. <laughs> I mean, 
you know, the, the guys that are, that are, you know, making a million dollars or two million dollars a year as CEOs, they, these guys are at home doing Zoom just like I'm doing with you right now. I mean, the, the, the boardroom is dead. I mean, yeah. Google has announced, hey, you guys, if you want to stay home and do business, stay home and do business, right? Yeah. So as one of the industries, as you mentioned, that survived, but not only just survived, but is growing exponentially as a result of COVID, cannabis is one. I'm not yeah. going to say it's it, but it's definitely one, right? Um, and I think this is the swinging moment that says, hey, guess what? Cannabis is a science. It's an entity. It's an industry that's not going anywhere. It's here. Uh, and it's here it's to stay. It's for innovation. I mean, yeah. we opened the doors for innovation. And I kind of feel bad sometimes when people say, oh, are you getting by? Are you doing okay? I don't know very many people that are making millions yet in hemp. Right. <laughs> However... Right. I'm busy and I love having the conversation and we're moving the needle and putting the supply chain together because we have an opportunity now. Yeah. So we can crawl in a hole and really we'll drown, bury our, dig our own holes, or we have an opportunity to make massive change. And I, I, again, I go back to my passion or what I became passionate about was mm -hmm. not even brought to light until I started looking into hemp. Right. The labor laws, the relationship yep. from labor laws to yep. textiles is you know and, and during the pandemic we had this big human trafficking blow up you know and what's happening there and how can you not relate that to your one dollar t-shirt well i i got I, I i just remembered as you were saying that i had a friend of mine in hillsboro he um he was a mechanical engineer at uc davis and he could not figure out how to get his fancy porsches from europe here without going through all the EPA DOT stuff and, and losing the profit on the car as a result of doing so. And so I just thought about it. He had the cars disassembled over there, shipped them over here in parts and put them back together again here. Really creative, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so a friend of mine in Las Vegas has the same issue, which means he owns hemp farms across the United States. He's friends with most of the hemp farmers across the United States. And they've been figuring out what do we do with all this biomass? So he's currently focused on uh, turning into the distillate and isolate and, and selling it on the open market uh, by the kilo, of course, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's the, there's only one challenge. Um, and the challenge is, is that you just have to be creative uh, in your thinking. You have to be really creative in your thinking um, about what to do with your with your farm um, um, and with and with, you know, uh, uh, the, the output from your farm as well. It, it's not just it's not just distillate and isolate. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, and I think you said it earlier. You know, understanding what do, what is it you're trying to produce? What product are you or market are you trying to feed into with your crop before right. you plant it? Right. right. So that makes or where you plant it or how much of it you plant. Because like you right. said, there's you know thousands and thousands, hundreds and thousands of buy uh, you know acres of cbd flour and right. the market just isn't there anymore like it is for fiber and some of these others right right yeah um you know the, again the 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 alternatives are are huge uh, absolutely huge and so um you know sky's the limit uh we are we are in uh 20 20 20 21 at this point and uh, you know, the, the industry has come a long way in the last five years for me, but 10 years as, as, as a, a nation or as a whole. Um, and I've, I've got, again, still really good feelings about what's going to be happening here uh, with a new administration coming in. And with, like I said, what I see going on in Canada, what I see going on in Australia, what I see going on in Latin America, uh, and what I'm dealing with in, in, in Africa at this particular point. And so... Um, there's no reason why every other country in the world is moving so rapidly in regard to this this science and and this this uh, inventory and and we're we're being like held back by our own government. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Do you think that there will be change now that the USDA is putting money and the government is starting to put grants out? I mean, because really, I think there has to be public private partnerships available right, right now in order right. to grow. Right. Right. Do you think we're yeah. going to see some big growth, uh, not only in the R and D side, but yeah. the manufacturing, processing, right. bringing back to the U.S. Right. Yeah. And and so um, again, the the 
um, manufacturing facilities that, that, that I've seen across, you know, the United States um, are, have been trying to handle or trying to uh, uh, make partnerships on the tolling side uh, with, with, with the extractors. But the only issue is there's not enough extractors to handle that kind of biomass uh, and they're not willing to, uh, and they're not willing to make um, uh, or handle the, the kind of uh, kind of biomass that's that's coming through coming from the growers themselves, and so um, you know, yep, you know, the the situ like I said before, I think it's time to focus on more more niche industries um, uh, that uh, uh, that focus on specific areas of, of need that's out there. Uh, that make absolute sense uh, for the future of the industry because, you know, again, um, coming into the industry early and trying to do, you know, a, a thousand acres of grow like a friend of mine did in Montana, um, and he did it at the wrong time of the of season, and guess what? They froze before they got a chance to be harvested, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to understand everything about the industry before – you choose the strain. Why are you choosing that strain before you plant it? Uh, and whether or not, what kind of grow source are you using? Is it indoor? Is it outdoor? Is it hydro? Is it, is it clay? And, and you know, all those things have to be considered uh, for you to think that you're going to be successful as far as ROI in the industry. You got to think about it. Think the, the whole gambit, the whole season. Uh, oh, and, and, and the atmosphere. Where are you? Are you in Humboldt County? Are you next to the ocean? How high is the elevation? How low? How much humidity? What time right. of the year? Right? Because Humboldt is not like Nebraska. Nebraska is not like Kentucky. Kentucky is not like North Carolina. And North Carolina is sure not like Florida. Exactly. All, all different. Right? Exactly. Well, and I think that that's been something to realize, too, as a consumer, the standardization. Of, you know, how, how do you standardize a crop that changes so drastically, not only in the agriculture side, but in the product side. Right. You know, I interviewed somebody the other day that great, gave a great example. When you take a two by four and you cut your two by four in half, now you have two pieces of wood. It doesn't structurally change that piece of wood. Right. But when you take a piece of uh, wood substitute that's been made from hemp and you cut it in half, now right. structurally those pieces have changed. Right. And so those things, you know, down to, like you said, the SOPs are the standards of how things are grown or manufactured or processed change very much. And this is where I go back to, you know, I really give credit to those that have been in the industry longer than 2018 or 2014, because they've gotten their hands dirty. Right. They've, you know, they, they really are our wealth of knowledge um, and expertise. Yeah. Well, here in, here in California, we, you know, and across the nation, if, if, if your home was built before a certain time, uh, there's there's just asbestos in it. And then when I was a kid, you know, these homes were built with things called plywood, which is basically a bunch of wood that's glued together, for God's sake. Um, and now we have this thing called a housing shortage here in California. Um, and and we all we all know what hempcrete is as well. Right. Uh, we all know what particle board is as well. And so why in the holy heck uh, is. Uh, 500 square feet in San Francisco cost a million dollars, but the, the the minimum wage just reached 15 dollars an hour. They don't not, not sustainable. Yeah, not yeah. sustainable. Well, and especially when products, like you said, are made with particle board. And right. I go back to relating. You know, when the pandemic happened, I wanted to buy a camp trailer. New right. camp trailers are made so poorly anymore. Right. I'm not talking poorly about anybody, but I was very taken back on the quality, even down to the cabinets, you know, right. yeah, compared right. to when we were, right? Yeah. So when you talk about, you know, uh, if the farmers can grow what they had grown and if they had access to capital, right? right. What do you think that they would do and why from the mistakes that they've already made? Well, again, I don't know what they would do, but this is what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they would do, but this is what I would do. Okay, uh, first of all, I, I'd find the best team I possibly could that had been there, done that, that had successfully, not question mark, successfully done an exit strategy in the industry worth a lot of money. That's what I would do. Number one. Number two, 
uh, I would write a solid business plan. And I don't mean something, some template I got off the internet for 1995. Invest in people who know how to write business plans, private place memorandums, and have taken companies public. That's number two. This is not a mom and pop, friends, fool, and family kind of situation anymore. You have to get serious, period. Yeah. Um, and in that business plan, I would make sure, absolutely, absolutely sure, without a, a shadow of a doubt, you've got a good attorney in there, a good legal team that understands the space, uh, that understands intellectual property, uh, and then move on to your branding and image. You have to have a website. You've got to have an app. Not kidding. You've got to find out your marketing and sales strategy because in that strategy, you're going to figure out what you're going to do with the plant when it comes on the ground. Um, and then you've got to have financial projections, three, five, seven year projections that if you send it to Merrill Lynch, the, the dumbest guy there will be able to understand exactly what you're trying to accomplish. And in those projections, you're going to have a proven ROI. Nobody wants to talk to you in this industry unless you can tell them what the ROI is, for God's sake. Oh, when you're all done, what's your exit strategy? What you going to do? You going public? You going private? You stay private? You're going to sell to your mom? Going to give to your grandkids? What you going to do, right? All right. this stuff has to be dialed in, spelled out, make absolute sense. Because if it doesn't, I, the people I met from Bank of America Securities, the people I'm talking to on Wall Street that have done $500 million in, trans $500 million in transactions in the space, they don't care. They're not going to well, listen to you. You said a few things. You know, this is when we get from a hobby to a real business. Right. And we're moving where price margins are smaller and smaller. Profit margins are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and into the commodity space. Yep. Right. That's it's right. more and more competitive and you've got to button up your act if you're going to play the game. Right. And compete. Well, you know, my grandmother came from Texas in 1945 and worked on ships at the shipyard for World War II. I, I come from hardworking people. I, right. I get it. Right. There's nothing wrong with hard work. As a matter of fact, I don't think if I defined a, a garden tool to my son, he wouldn't understand what I was saying. He would say, Dad, I'm busy with my video game. Don't bother me with that. Crap. Oh, yeah, I have one of those in Minecraft. <laughs> right? <laughs> but getting guys and girls uh, that have been in the black market in the mountains growing cannabis for 30 years have put their kids through college with this and tell them to come to Wall Street because we're going to write a business plan and raise capital. It's hard. It's tough. I get it. <laughs> I get it. And those that can do it, though, are are growing. They're making right. it. And it's where you bridge that gap and you're able to bring, I want to say, the real business into the cannabis business. Right? That's right. Or previous existing business in the cannabis business. That, that's, right. Um, that's right. Yeah. It, it's it's fascinating to me. And it's been something fun to watch. Yeah. Uh, you still had a question. And I don't know if you have any in input on this, but can the hemp industry aid in getting the THCV concentrate isolate into the market, or is that a cannabinoid exclu exclusive to traditional MMJ? Well, you, you know what the farm bill said. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we know what it said, right? And everybody's running around going, oh my God, I stopped you. Is, is that hemp or is that THC? Can I put you in jail, right? Um, and so, you know, and everybody says, if it's above 0 0.03, it's hot, or you, you have to dis expo dispose of it. But, but here's the difference. And, and they say garbage in, garbage out. Um, so you cannot say you had something tested on the flower level, go through an extraction process. We don't know which extraction process you used. And then at the end, when the crude comes out, you have to test it again because it's going to be totally different than when it went in as a flower, correct? So, so as far as legality is concerned, we always get stuck on that number, 0 0.03, right? So we don't care if it if you don't get caught at 0 0.03 before it goes in, and then you don't get caught at 0 0.03 as it comes out. And but staying compliant, I think, would be the number one issue, right? Because you you don't want to get in trouble. That that's that's what I would say. Well, I say that that's. I mean, being in Utah, that's what we're facing or talking about a lot and dealing with a lot, you know, they're very strict about that. And it's rolled over now into the processing side, right? right. And if I take a plant that's 0.028 pre-extraction pre to extraction, I'm automatically over. And so I'm with you. I think that it goes back to what's the profile of your flower or your plant and right. are you extracting and how, how uh, consistent is it? You know? Right. 
Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing is, is, is now the feds are starting to literally go around to these farms um, and catch people breaking the rules. And as a result of breaking the rules, they're giving them fines. And those fines are ending up putting people out of business, for God's sake. Right. So, you know, you all you have to plan for all contingencies, mold, bugs, Everybody. the FDA. <laughs> You've got you've you've got to plan for all contingencies on what's going to happen between the time you uh, drop that seed, uh, it comes to fruition, time to cure, and then what are you going to do? Are you going to extract? Are you going to wholesale? Uh, are are you going to turn into a material that's your own internal brand because you're vertically integrated, and you're going to put your own brand on the market? And even if you do box something up, uh, because I remember in 1978 I went to the pier in San Francisco, I bought a yellow box. It was just a yellow box. And guess what was inside? A pet rock. Wow. Somebody was a marketing genius, I'll tell you. <laughs> marketing. Yeah. I had to have it, though, because I had my own pet rock. So um, vertically integrated has its challenges, too. But you'd be really brave to be a farmer. You'd have to be a niche farmer and have a really special product and made a really special brand. Uh, if you're going to push it out to the market on your own recognizance, a lot of guts, lots of money for sure. Well, and again, that's that boutique. I think there will be a place just like craft wines and craft beers, right? There's boutique grows that I think will exist. But again, this goes back to our relationships and understanding what are you doing with that product before you're right. pushing it out on the market. It's right. Yeah. So until look at Canada, I mean, Canada had the big guys, Aurora out there, just, oh, my God, it's federally legal. We're going to take over the world kind of thing. But they just shut down a 500,000 square foot grow out there. So we finally realized, including Oregon, if you put too much product out in the market, what's it going to do to the value of the product? It's going right. to shoot it down. Right. But the boutique growers up there in Canada, the niche growers up in Canada are doing very well because they decided to focus on a specific corner of the industry. They made it, they, they're the best at what they do, and people love their brands, period. Yeah. Right. And um, I think there's a place for both of those. Mm -hmm. right? But here it's when, when we talk big opportunities, you know, we talked about proteins and sugars, and what about batteries and graphene? What are you seeing in the US? Are people, I mean, are you seeing the use of? Well, all I can say is, oh my God, 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 oh my God. Because um, again, I'm from the wireless industry. And again, what's the biggest problem we have with smartphones and laptops? Yeah, my battery dies. That's my friend. <laughs> Power, right? And, and what are we going to do with 6 billion devices around the world running 5G? What's going to be the problem? Right. Power, right? <laughs> Power. <laughs> so uh, Biden has already, you know, reached out to UC Berkeley and Pick the power girl from here, and he's going to be focused on energy, 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 energy. And what is energy? It is power. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody can perfect that for real, I mean, for real, for real, that's that's huge. That is absolutely huge. So. Well, and it's what, what's not being talked about, right? Is the yeah. battery the use. Everybody, again, now is starting to talk about the textiles and the clothes and the construction material. But when somebody says... Uh, what can be made out of hemp? My right. response was look around. Anything you see for the most part is made out of hemp. And that's no exact or can be made out of hemp. And it's no exaggeration. Yes. Yeah. And, and li literally, I mean, kids, I mean, think about it. Nike just Nike just said they've got hemp tennis shoes. It's not a joke. Um, uh, there are car there are cars from people don't know that Ford's first car was not gas. It was an electric car. Number one. Number two. Um, the tires that are made on a car, the food that's fed to your cattle, the um, there's even a car out now where the car is made of hemp, the engine's made of hemp, and guess what else? The fuel comes from hemp. So um, any industry you can think of that that drove America's economy from the beginning, uh, from petroleum to tobacco, um, are things that are related to hemp, the hemp plant for sure. You can smoke it and you can drive it. There you the, go. The newspaper, the right. all of our articles, everything, right? That's right. 
Well, I sure am glad and blessed to have you on. I appreciate you taking your time with me today. Um, if, what else? How do people get in touch with you if they want to reach out or if they want to, if they have questions? What are you What are you looking for, and how can people get involved? Well, here, here's the bottom line of where I am or what I want to do when I grow up. Period. Um, I'm still trying to figure mine out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know yet, but for the last. 30 years, like I said, I fell in love with Angel Seed Venture Capital in innovations and entrepreneurs. I just love it. I just love it. Um, and in the last five years, it's been cannabis focused, which people told me five years ago, don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, my God. It's a mistake. Now it's five years later. I don't think it was a mistake. And so helping some other people that came from Wall Street build some funds where they were only interested, profit, 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 profit. How much money can we make? We're going to make billions of dollars in the exit strategy. Well, I'm putting together my own fund at this point. I've got it's built. I'm, I'm going to launch it, um, and um, it will be focused on uh, social impact. It will be focused on uh, it, it, what they call opportunity zones, which are dilapidated areas across the United States, um, and it will be focused on cannabis and hemp merger and acquisitions that I'm in, in the process of right now uh, in countries like Australia, Canada, South America, Africa, and Europe, and here in the United States. Um, and I think with the new administration coming in, we've got high hopes um, to see if we can make it happen. But uh, if there's any, yeah, if there's anything you need from cultivation to extraction to manufacturing, distribution, delivery, retail across the United States, and you're confused on how to do it, let's talk. I mean, I've, I've been here for a while. Just I love to, it. Yeah. Well, so. I'd also love to have you involved. I said this many times on our association. We meet on January. I think it's the 15th. Ooh, I should probably look before I say that out loud. Um, but we do a monthly meeting. It's an awesome opportunity to get to know people, to really build relationships and connections. Mm -hmm. and we have committee groups that are our how to uh, accomplish some of these. And each committee is based on, they, they meet depending on their tasks or projects yep. they're working on from construction, textile, education, safety, SOPs, um, things like that. And so I'd love to have you involved. And I'd really love to invite any of your prospects or clients as well um, my goal again was to build a platform where we can connect and build relationships and yep. um, highlight those that are doing it right. So thank you very much for joining me and participating. I'm excited. Uh, I'm, I'm really proud of what you're doing, Mandy. And if, if you're in Utah, Utah doing this, you really have a lot of guts. I'll tell you, I got to give it to you. <laughs> you know, it's been, it was eye opening to me. All I had to do is wear a t-shirt that said hashtag got CBD. Right. And everybody wanted to talk. Really? And so it's as much as it's this, you know, faux pas, nobody wants to talk about it out loud. Yeah. People realize we have to change. Our air quality in Utah is one of the worst in the nation. And really? it's horrible because we sit in this valley. Yeah. In the mountains. And so our air quality is rotten. Wow. And I saw rural, rural farmers that really we could benefit from. It. Anyways. So, yeah. And I'm actually from Wyoming. So like the Montana, Wyoming, Utah. Yeah. Area yeah. Is where yeah. I'm passionate about. Yeah. Well, I drove to Wyoming coming back from Illinois, and boy, it was the most one of the most beautiful air quality states I've ever been through in my life. But it was just a timid drive through. But it was air quality. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you don't hit it during the winter when all the semis are blown over on the road. And yes. Well, think about it. Chicago, Illinois, if you don't want to talk about winters and dirty trucks. Oh, my God. It's all good. Thanks You're again, Mandy. Thank you, Darius. I appreciate you. We'll be in touch. Thank Have you. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.